How many came to church because you wanted God to speak to you? Good. So all 20 of you that just lifted your hand right now, you and I and Jesus, it's going to be an amazing service. Turn to somebody and uh, just turn to them and say, God's got something for you today. God's got something for you. And then turn to somebody on the other side, your second choice. They weren't your first choice. <laughs> Tell them the same thing. God's got something for you today. How many believe God has something for us today? Let me say a couple things before we get into the, the Bible. I want our church, all four services, I want our church to be a, here's the key word, participative. Everyone say that, participate. So this isn't like we're at a Dodger game or something where you're watching everybody else on the field play. You are in, like you're in the game. So when you come to church, not only do you come on time, and I want to take ownership because sometimes I go a little late and then the parking gets all messed up, but when you get here, I want you to bring your A game. How many know God deserves our A game? So if your A game is just like, then bring your A game. Uh, but I, I, love, uh, I love participative services. I like amen, preach it. I love, I mean, if you want to swing from a chandelier, we don't have any, but um, uh, I, I just love back and forth. I love that we're awake and uh, I, I don't want to pastor our church where everybody's falling asleep and because he's too worthy of that, right? He rose from the dead. So it's okay to get into it. It's okay to make some noise and uh, he's so good all the time. So when we worship, when the band starts again, you're not watching them and going, oh, that's cool how he did that little lick. No, we're, we're giving God all of our praise and all of our worship and then bring your Bible to church or your phone or your iPad, all you snooty rich people that bring iPads and stuff. But uh, bring your Bible to church and come with, most importantly, with a hungry heart, a passionate heart to reach, to, to worship Jesus. Also, uh, this Wednesday, probably my favorite service is our first Wednesday services. How many have ever been part of a first Wednesday? It's like, somebody said this years ago, you can tell how, pastor the, how popular the pastor is by how many people show up on Sunday morning. You know how popular Jesus is in the church by how many people will come to a night of prayer and worship. So let's see how popular Jesus is. And uh, Wednesday night, we're fasting all day. Then we have some food out on the deck. And then we gather with some crazy Christians. And it's powerful. And it's, I mean, it's powerful what God does on Wednesday night. So if you've never been, come. If you've been before, come again. And uh, God's going to do a great work on Wednesday night. Amen? Amen. Amen. Preach it. I did a good job of my son's hair. Just thought I'd throw that in. All right. Daniel chapter 6. That was weird. Daniel chapter 6. Grab your Bible there. Hurry. Daniel 6. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. We are in week number 4 in our series. Uh, the title of the series is, come on. The title of the series is, I just gave you a lecture on being participative. Uh, I know you were turning in your Bibles and you can't talk. I apologize. So the title of the series is Stand. Uh, Daniel chapter 1 uh, was the first week. Daniel chapter 3 last week. Daniel chapter 4. Today I want to talk about standing strong. Stand strong. Let's all say it together. Ready to go. Question, how many want to stand strong for Jesus, not just like Sunday morning or Monday? I want every single day of my life, I want to stand strong in my marriage. I want to stand strong in my parenting, in my convictions, in my worship. I don't care what people have to say. Uh, I'm, I'm going after God 100%, not perfectly. But the Bible says he who endures to the very end will be saved. So I'm in it for the long haul. How many are in, the, in it for the long haul? You're not just trying out Jesus for a couple weeks. I tried him and it didn't work. How I many know he always works, by the way? But I, I like, he died for me, I'm giving him my all, and I want to stand strong for him each and every day. And that's uh, what we're going to find out in Daniel chapter 6. It's a very famous story, Daniel and the lion's den. Okay, how many have ever heard this story before? Okay, let me kind of mess with your storyboard Jesus that you learned in Sunday school. Because we were taught that he was like a teenager in the lion's den. Yeah. Eh. All of God's people said. Now, he's, he's about 85 years old. Uh, the, Daniel chapter 3, when he was in the fiery furnace, he was about 14 or 15. Last week in Daniel chapter 4, he was about 40 or 50 years old. Now he's about 85 years old, which is a great opportunity, look at me, for me to tell you, even if you're in your 70s and 80s, God can use you in a powerful way. I don't know exactly when I'm going to pass the baton on to the next person that will pass to this church, but uh, it could be a decade or so. But I, I, even in my 60s, 70s, and 80s, I still want to travel. I still want to preach. I still want to, uh, whether it's training for life or our New Life Institute, I'm never going to stop telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ, whether I'm 70, 80, or 90. And that's where Daniel's at here in Daniel chapter 6. 85 years old, but he's still going strong for Jesus. I love it. So let's pray. Lord, bless your word. Amen. That's it. That's it. Turn to somebody and say, that's it. Nothing in the Bible about long prayers, by the way. God will bless a short prayer. And uh, so, if you want to stand strong, um, I just asked you, let me see your hand again. You want to stand strong for God. 
Let me see your hand up. If you don't have your hand, that's weird that you would come to church. But anyhow, we're <laughs> glad you're here. I want to stand strong for him. It's going to require four things, okay? And it's right out of the text. If you want to stand strong for God, it will require that you understand four things. You ready? Here we go. Point number one. Write this first, and then we'll start reading the Bible. Number one, if we're going to stand strong for God, we have to live righteously. Live, keyword is righteously. Live righteously. You're like, where did you get that in the Bible? Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. You ready to start reading? All right, me too. And uh, I'll read, and you can follow along. Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 in the NIV. The Bible says, now Daniel, notice these two words, so distinguished. Let's say it together. Ready? So, thank you. The five of you that just repeated. Let's try it again. He, what did he do? He so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So here in Daniel 6, uh, we're, we're not studying about King Nebuchadnezzar. Now we're in the third king over Babylon. This guy's name is Darius. And Daniel was one of the three guys underneath uh, 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 Darius. And so he's been promoted by God and by the king of Babylon. Why? Because of his exceptional qualities. That The new King James says he had an excellent I love this. He had an excellent spirit. Would you look at me? I'm going to ask you a question. What is like the one asset that you really have going for yourself? Like if you were to say, when people think of Steve Abraham, they think of, what, what would they say about you? Some of you would be like, my looks. I'm just so muy wapo. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> and uh, how, how many of you go to the gym sometimes and some people, they just, all they do is lift weights and work out. And if you were to say, hey, what's the one asset that, that people, like my you know those guys, they look at the mirror all the time, and you're just like, whatever, whatever. Is it your education? Is it your brains? Is it your influence? Is it your position? Is it your power? Is it how much money you have, the, the nice car that you have? According to God, I think what is really important is Daniel had an excellent spirit, and he distinguished himself amongst anybody else. In other words, I want to ask you a question. How are you different than anybody else that you work with? The way that you talk, are you, are you different on the job? Are you different at school? Everybody else is cussing and everybody else is talking about who they slept with on Friday night. Do you think differently? Do you act differently? Do you talk differently? Is your, is your attitude different than anybody else? What is setting you apart? What is distinguishing you? According to the Bible, Daniel was so distinguished amongst anybody else. So what's different about you, your temperament, your attitude? It says a whole lot about the kind of person that you are. And check out what verse 4 says. At this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him. Someone just say awesome. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Check it out what it says in the message. Look at this verse in the message. It says, the vice regents and governors got together to find some old scandal or skeleton in Daniel's life that they could use against them, but they couldn't dig up anything. Isn't that great? They couldn't dig up anything. We're like, in this, in this culture that we live in, in the political arena, how many know we're going back 10 years, 20, 30, 40? What did they do in junior high? What did they say in high school? How many know we're all busted? If everybody starts talking about what we did in junior high or high school, but check it out, in Daniel's life, they went back and they said, what kind of student was he? The teachers are like, he was amazing. He had perfect attendance. How many have perfect attendance? Do not raise your hand. But he had perfect attendance. He, did he ever fight with anybody in the lunch line? No, he was just amazing. He had a great attitude. had a great, well, okay, so he's great at school. But then they were talking to his parents. What kind of kid was he? He was amazing. He did his chores all the time. He never fought with his brothers or sisters. Okay, so he's great at school. He was great in his family. But, hey, let's, get, let, let's check out the computer. Let's check out the search engine. Let's check out the history. And they went through all this stuff, and they couldn't find any scandalous thing about him. They couldn't. When he went on, they went on Netflix, they didn't see him watching any rated R movies. They, they never discovered anything in his life, and they tried to find something on him. But check it out. They couldn't dig up anything. Why? Because he was so distinguished amongst anybody else. He lived a righteous life life. His vocabulary was different. His attitude was different. His work ethic was different. His generosity was different. Well, what was he like when he worked at Chick-fil-A? Well, he was always on time. In fact, he, when, he, when he worked, he did it unto the Lord. And you couldn't find anything. Isn't that awesome? That people would be able to say about you and I, they couldn't dig up anything on us. And 
Why? He lived a righteous life. Check out this. 1 Timothy 6, 11 says, But you, Timothy, Paul talking to his protege, Timothy, you are a man of God, so run from evil, desi- evil things, pursue righteousness, and live a godly life. I want to ask you a question. Are you leaving evil things, and are you pursuing a righteous, godly life? Let me, let me say, can you imagine if a guy went to a bar on Friday night, and when the girl went out to the dance on the floor, he put something in her drink to spike the drink. She came back and she started to get all, you know, tired and stuff. He brought her back to his apartment. He took advantage of her. I mean, oh, that's awful. That is, that is repulsive. And what if he took advantage of that young girl and then the next day she had a birthday party and he shows up at the birthday party after taking advantage of her on Friday night and goes to the birthday party and starts singing, happy birthday to you. Wow. Isn't that wicked? to think about that. Isn't that repulsive? But how many of us, we live like we want all the way during the week, Monday through Friday through Saturday, then we show up on Sunday morning and sing a couple songs to him. Happy birthday to Jesus. And we think that God doesn't really care how we live during the week. And I'm here to tell you, God does care how we live during the week. And we can't live how we want during the week and then show up on Sunday and sing happy birthday to Jesus. So on Thursday... I was just in my office and I really felt like the Lord said, and I don't use that word lightly because I get bothered whenever the Lord told me, the Lord told me, the Lord told me, the Lord told me. Well, you better be careful when you throw out the Lord told me, but I, I just sensed that the Lord said, I want you to tell my church that I'm very serious about sin. So I came to church on Sunday to let you know what the Lord told me to tell you. Here's what he told me to tell you. He's very serious about sin. He is holy, holy, Holy. Around the throne, they're just singing one song. It's not here again. It's not on Christ alone. It's not freedom. It's holy, holy, holy. The word holy just means set apart or different. And if you want to stand for Jesus Christ in the middle of the culture, you have to, number one, live. Key word is what? Righteously. Righteously. Someone say righteously. So that's it. Very, I always think about this every time I eat fish. It's a weird transition, but I just thought of it. Every time I go to a restaurant where you have fish, they bring the fish out to you, and the first thing I do is I get my salt and pepper and I put salt on my fish. Now think about that, That's, isn't that weird? You're like, no, it's, I do it too. But think about this, the fish was living in a salt sea. <laughs> you ever thought about that? It's living its whole life in salt. They bring it to you at the table, and what do you do? You put salt on it. Why? Because although it lived in, a, in salt water, for whatever reason, God allowed that fish to not consume, be consumed by the salt. Check it out. If he can do that for fish, he can do that for you and I. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. And God is calling our church to live a righteous life. Notice, I'm not saying to live a perfect life. I'm just saying we're all going to fall short, right? But a righteous man falls seven times and we rise again. This is no perfect people out at this church, but this is a church that's pursuing righteousness, pursuing godliness, that our Instagram is different than any other Instagram. And our, our, our Facebook is different. We don't blast people. We don't put all these crazy, no, no. We're living a righteous life, pursuing evil and going after God. Anybody in this church going after God? Do you know one day I wanna, pre- I wanna present to, to God because God said he's coming back for a holy church without blemish, right? I, so my wife and I will stand before God and we'll, we'll present new life. Here's the kind of church I want to present, holy, set apart, different. I'm not responsible for Calvary Chapel or the Presbyterian Church or the Methodist Church or the Catholic Church. We are responsible for this church. We are going after holiness and godliness. You're like, well, I'm not interested. Then it would probably be better for you to find a different church because we're contending to be more like Jesus. Anybody in the room contending to more? Come on, then put your hands together and thank him. Live, keyword is righteous. So Daniel was... Set apart, set apart, set apart. Number two, come on, if you want to stand strong for God, you got a number two. You're not going to like this, but I'll say it anyhow. Number two, expect hostility. So some of the other leaders get jealous and they kind of go hunger games on Daniel. And I'll prove it to you in verses six through nine. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. So they agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty will be thrown into the lion's den. Now your majesty issued the decree and put it in writing that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Check it out, here's what's happening. 
So remember they did the whole digging up Daniel's, they can't find anything. So like, here's what we're going to do. We got a plan. Here's the plan. Let's go to King Darius and tell him to put a decree in writing that if anybody prays to another God or another man for the next 30 days and we catch them, they're going to get thrown into the lion's den. They're like, awesome plan, awesome plan. So they write this whole decree, right? Because how many know when you start getting promoted, look right into my eyes, when you start getting promoted, people start getting ticked off. You get a brand new car, they're like, how did they get a car? How did they afford it? I've been driving this stupid smart car for like 10 years and they got a, like, you know what I'm talking about? I've even had people talk like, well, if I had all the people that they have at New Life, if we had the screen, if we had the, if we had 500, if we had 500 volunteers, but do you know that we started the church with 40 people? And so be thankful about where you're at. And, uh, but how many of the haters are coming out? They are, the, I, I promise you, because Daniel was set apart, people started getting ticked off. And so they come up with this plan. We're going we're gonna to catch him in the act, right? And, and, and we want, King, we want you to write it down. Check out this verse, Philippians 1.29, coming on the screen. You have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ. How many know it's a privilege to trust in Christ? We love that part. We amen that part. Come on, that's good stuff. We don't like the, we don't like the last part but also the privilege of suffering for him, suffering for him. I promise you, if you will live a committed life, I say, I'm going to stand for Jesus. I promise you hostility is coming, opposition is coming, haters are coming. I'm telling you, trials are coming. Is this true or false, right? It's true. It's coming. Not, not if, when. When? How many have ever wanted to go swimming in the ocean or the pool and you kind of stuck your foot in the pool and say, oh, it's freezing, but let's do it anyhow. So cool. So what do you do? You kind of get back there and you grab a friend like, let's do it together. Right Right before you jump in. Here's what I do. I kind of brace myself. You know what I'm talking about? Because right when the cold hits your back fat right there, it's just like, oh, oh. You ever been on a bumper car at the carnival? You're just having a good time and there's this like 12-year-old little demonic kid coming right at you. And he's trying to, and right before he hits your car, what do you do? You kind of brace yourself, right? And that's what I'm telling you. Look into my eyes. Suffering is coming your way. People are going to come against you. Hostility. It's not if, it's when. James says, hey, when various trials come. So check it out. Relational conflict coming, but bring it on. God's on my side. Financial challenges, it's coming. Family, family's coming. Thanksgiving's coming up. Christmas is coming. Their, Uncle Eddie's going to show up, probably all drunk at your party. It's coming. Hey, there's going to be problems at your job, but hey, bring it on. God's on my side. You got to expect hostility. I was thinking about Job this week. Job, 40 chapters, and one entire book is given to Job. So when I say, what is Job known for? What do you say? Suffering. I mean, he was doing awesome. He had a great marriage, great kids. Things are going great until God had a conversation with Satan. God's like, hey, have you considered my servant Job? What happened? Everything was taken from him. His wife turned his back on him. Kids left him. Friends left him. No job. No money. Got boils from head to toe. Can you imagine that? I, I've, I've always heard, I've heard people say, hey, can you pray that God will bless me? Can you pray that I get a promotion? Can you pray that I get an Elisha spirit? I need a double anointing. When's the last time you said, can you pray for me? I want a Job anointing. Have you ever had anybody, like, I've never had somebody come forward. Can you imagine that? Yeah, I, oh, God, that's awesome. Yeah, bring on the boils. Give me a little leprosy while you're at it. Take it all, Lord. You could have it all, Lord. When's the last time? Like, no. But what is he known for? He's known for somebody that lost it all, but at the very end, God gave him everything back. But he never, he says, hey, though the Lord slay me, still I'm going to trust him. And he had hostility after hostility after hostility. So the trials are coming. And people are like, well, then why should I serve God? Because when you're not serving God, you're going to still have trials, right? And if you serve God, you still have trials. The good news is that God will be with you in the trials. Have you ever thought about this? You go to a bookstore. The biggest section at the bookstore is those self-help sections. Book after book after book after book. I want to know this. If those books really help... Why is that the biggest section in the bookstore? <laughs> shouldn't, that, shouldn't that whole area just be empty? Uh, because we're trying to go to this, trying to go to this, trying to go to this. Trying, no, no, no. And, and we don't need self-help. We need God's help in the middle of our trials. Amen? All right. Here we go. Point number three. Write this down. Number three, if you're going to stand strong for God, you've got to maintain consistency. Maintain consistency. And I was so 
convicted this week in my study when I got to verse 10. Because they got this plan, they got it in writing, the king signed it, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Check this out. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Three times a day. When's the last time you prayed three times a day? Like, not just like on the way to your job. Lord, help me with that prayer. They're driving me crazy. No, but I'm like, you carved out 10 or 15 minutes morning. I'm super convicted by that. Three times a day. I find myself using prayer like, like when I get a flat tire in my car, you pull off to the side and you, it's like a spare tire. It's an emergency. So I pull off to the side of the road, you put a new tire. That's, sometimes I'm guilty of praying like that. Like, God, I need you to... And then he does it, then we just move on with our life. But three times a day, the Bible says in verse 10, as Daniel was accustomed to. In other words, he maintained consistency. Every day, three times a day, he prayed to God. How many know if you're going to be great at anything, you have to have consistency? All of our musicians up here, the reason why they're so good at what they do, I'm telling you, like guitar, it's chord, chord, G, G, D, 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 E, E. You practice over and over. Keyboard, scale, 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 scale. I discovered this week, when Kobe Bryant would have a bad game when he played, the next day at practice, he would ask the manager to stay over. He would shoot a thousand shots. He would just say, a thousand shots. That's how you get better. You want to have a great prayer life? You got to pray. You, got to, you want to know God's word? You got to get into God's word. You got to maintain consistency. If you want to be in physical shape, should I go there? Yeah, I'm going to go there. Let's just, because right, we're going to start January 1st, right? So let's just, let's just, so if you, but if you want to be in shape, you, can't, you got to work out like at least a couple days a week. You can't say, well, I did five push-ups two weeks ago. That doesn't help. Like, you got to work out three or four or five times a week. You can, if you want to eat good, you can't say, well, I had a tofu Omelet this morning, and then you go to In N Out and Tommy's for lunch and dinner. It doesn't happen though. You gotta, that's convicting, isn't it? Maintain consistency. So I love this. So they, they catch Daniel. What is he? He's praying three times a day. He's going after God three times a day. He's doing what has been consistent just as he had been, always been doing. Love that. So, so they catch him, right? The crew catches him because they're, they're after him. And so there he is in his palace, he's down on his knees praying, and then they got, I don't know, they, they got the paparazzi there, some binoculars, and they, they caught him in the act of praying. So they go back to the king, and they're like, hey, didn't you sign a decree? Yeah. We just caught Daniel. By the way, they don't even ask for evidence. They, they should have said, well, let me see the cell phone, because you did video? No, no, he, we just saw him. Take our word for it. Which brings me to the fourth thing and my least favorite point. Ready? If we're going to stand strong for God, number four, you got to wait patiently. Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron to wait? Okay, that's great. How, how am I going to wait? Well, you're going to wait patiently. Wait patiently. Check this out in the text. Verses 16. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the ring of his noble so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without entertaining, entertainment being brought to him. Notice this, and he could not sleep. That's the king. You're like, you couldn't sleep. <laughs> you ain't in the lion's den, man. How, how about Daniel? Daniel couldn't sleep. Now, I want to talk a little bit about waiting. Everybody look right into my eyeballs. I don't have very many positive qualities. I have a lot more negative qualities, honestly. You could talk to my wife after the service or my kids. Uh, and, at, and I have a lot of negative ones. And at the top of my list of negative qualities that I have, I am so impatient. Anybody else? Don't leave your pastor hanging on the stage here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. The Lord loves you. Did you have your hand up? Sort of, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some of you are late in raising your hand because you're impatient. No, just kidding. Uh, so check this out. Like, I, I'm like, I'm finding myself I don't enjoy whatever because I'm just waiting for the next thing. So Andy and I, a couple months ago, we went and picked up my daughter from Texas to drive her back out here to move. And I'm like, we'd like pull in to get gas. I'm like, okay, we got 10 minutes. They're like 10. I'm like 10. 
We're 10 minutes. You're going to get something to drink, get some whatever your snack, go to the restroom, and the car's leaving in 10 minutes. I know, but we're in needles. I don't care if we're in needles, California. We're leaving in 10 minutes. You understand? So it's like, hurry, hurry. And I just, every stop, hurry, 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 hurry. And I found, we finally got here. I'm like, why are you, why are you such a hurry? Like, okay, we got to Oxnard 90 minutes early. Like, okay. But you like had no fun on the trip. Does anybody else come? You know what? Like, I was driving to the, 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 the church today. It was like, 545, getting on the on-ramp, and the lady's going like 30 miles an hour. I don't know. I shouldn't say lady. I'm not sure if it was a, it was probably a lady. No, I'm kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Just relax. It's a, it's a joke. You guys are so immature. No, so, like, literally, like, 20, like, going on the offer, like, hurry! I'm just like, what are you doing? Like, that's just me. I, I go to the store. Come on. You go to the store, like at Walmart or Vons, and like, like the clerk is so slow. <laughs> you got all these items, right? And there's 18 people behind you, but she, no, he, I'm going to say he, not she, he. He's like taking your, like, you know, scanning it like this speed. <laughs> Can you please hurry? Like, are you, I just, I'm sorry. Please pray for me. I need serious deliverance. I, I am so impatient. Then I, I get to this text and I, I'm preaching about waiting patiently. Now, I've said this every week in the series. We already know the end of the story. Yes, yeah, that's yeah, great. So the angel shows up in the lion's den and shuts the mouth of the lions and Daniel goes free. Oh, what a great story. Hallelujah. But Daniel didn't know that. So they put, they put him in at night, and what do you think he was doing in the lion's den? Everybody always says that, praying, and I agree, probably he was praying. But maybe freaking out, maybe panicking. Think about all these lions. It wasn't just one, there was many lions. And do you know they would actually starve the lions for a few days, so when they threw somebody in, right? So I'm sure they were hungry, and they were, Rrr. I'm just, I see myself in the corner like them, I would just like go karate kid, like, ah, just like do something weird, like, ah, they're like, Dude, don't mess with him. I don't know what he was doing. He was probably panicking, he might have been sweating a little bit, because we know the end of the story, he didn't know the end of the story. He might have had some beats on, listen to, our God is an awesome God, who knows what he was doing. I think a combination of everything, but I came to church to let you know, if you're going to stand strong for Christ, you have to wait on God. I've discovered this in serving God, there's not a lot of green light. Lights. He's not like, okay, you're gonna get that. Okay, you're gonna get, you're gonna get this too, Steve, and you're gonna get this, Steve, and this, and it's usually like, no, Steve, you're not ready. So just keep waiting upon me. And how do, we, how are we to wait? Wait patiently. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here's what I've discovered. It's the hardest pro- problem is in the waiting. My, my dad used to give me a spanking, but before he did, he said, go up to your room right now. I'll be up there in a few minutes. <laughs> Those 15 minutes were like, I'm just like, hey, dad, can you beat me before I go? Like, just <laughs> beat me now. Like, hit me, right? Because going up to the room and you're just in your room by yourself and you're like, oh, what's, how many, what's he going to use? to spank me, and how many spankings am I going to get? Like, how many of the waiting is the worst part, isn't it? Just get it over now. I, I, no, no, but, and serving God, it's like, Steve, you're not ready. Wait patiently upon me. And Daniel did, and we know the end of the story. The angel came in, one angel. Did I say this in the service? I can't remember. One angel in the Old Testament took down 185,000 Assyrians. So one angel shows up in the den. God's like, I got this covered because he waited patiently upon me. We have any baseball ple- people that played baseball in high school or softball? Or softball, ladies, where you at? Make some noise. Come on. And uh, God bless you. Um, I had an older brother, four years older than me. So every time, like basketball season came around, I never got new shoes. He would get new shoes and I would get hand-me-downs. He would get a brand new glove, I would get hand-me-downs. I thought I'd get more love than that. Let me try it again. Uh, hold on, hold on. Let me say it, then you can respond. So I always got hand-me-downs. I know, it's really sad. Uh, so every glove, hand-me-down, this, hand-me-down, bat. But finally, about 11 or 12 years old, I got, my dad bought me a brand new baseball glove. 
How many have ever gotten a brand new baseball glove? That thing is hard as a rock. <laughs> right? So what do you do? They tell you, put a little oil in the middle, right? Wipe oil on it. You put like a softball inside of the baseball mitt, and then you wrap it in string or something. Why? Because the glove is too hard, too rigid, too, too stubborn. It needs oil, and it needs time. Ready for this? How many know that that's our heart and our attitude a lot of the time? We're just like little rigid, little hard, and God, I want it now. He's like, no, 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 no. You're not quite ready. I'm going to put a little whole oil, Holy Spirit on you, and then I'm going to make you wait. No, but I want to get married. I know, but you're like 17. You don't even have a job. You're not ready. <laughs> so you're just not ready. And I know, but I want this dream to come true. I want a position. I want a platform. I want to preach like you. I know, but you're too young. You don't have enough experience. Your heart's not in the right place. You're not ready for your dreams to be fulfilled. You're not ready to have kids. You're a kid yourself. So God's like, no, I need a little more Holy Spirit on you, and you need a little more time. Praise God for the prayers that he did not answer. So I prayed for some stupid stuff, and I wasn't ready for that. God's like, no, you need more Holy Spirit. You need more time. Why? Because a hard glove, you can't, you'll drop stuff. And a hard heart, you'll drop people and things. So God says, no, more Holy Spirit, more time. So we got to wait on him. I know it's not a sexy message, but we got to wait patiently on him. Years ago, I went to Indonesia on a missions trip. I preached at a church on Sunday morning, and I called my wife and talked to the girls. And then I think Ryan was the last one I talked to. He's probably 10 years old. He goes, hey, how's it going? I said, oh, I just preached at a church on Sunday morning, and me and a couple pastors are going to lunch. He's like, oh, really? Uh, do you guys have, they have church on Saturday? I said, no, uh, I just got out of church. We're going to lunch. I said, it's, uh, it's Sunday here. So we're 14 hours ahead. I said, we crossed the international date line. 10 years old, he's like, oh. He still doesn't know what it is. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, no, we're, we're 14 hours ahead. Sunday here. Well, it's only Saturday night here. So I remember him saying this. He said, well, can you tell me what happens tomorrow? And I said, yeah, tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to go to church. And in your classroom, you're going to behave to all the teachers. It's going to be amazing. You're not going to give them an attitude. You're not going to talk back to your mom. You're going to help her. You're not going to fight with your two sisters. It's going to be a great day. So listen, I was in Sunday telling him about his Sunday that happened, hasn't happened yet. And I came to church to let you know God is already in your tomorrow. Whatever you've been waiting on him for, he's already been there. It's not the international dateline. It's a supernatural dateline. God's already been there. And he says, I'll give you what you don't have. I'm more than enough. I am sufficient. I will meet all of your needs. Wait patiently on the Lord. He will renew your strength. Come on, somebody make some noise in this play. He is worthy. He is worthy, and you've been waiting, and you've been waiting, and you've been waiting, and I'm telling you, God will meet every single need that you have according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's already been in your tomorrow. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the God of everlasting. Come on, somebody put your hands together. Worthy is he. Worthy is he. Praise God. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Standing strong for God. That's my prayer. Standing strong for Him. With your head bowed and your eyes closed. We have five or six minutes left. I'm going to invite you not to leave the room. I'm going to invite you just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed right here in this place. We sang it earlier. The Lord is in this place. Not for a minute were we forsaken. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and I want to talk to everybody that calls Jesus Lord a new life your home. Would you pray right now? Pray like you have never prayed before. Because there are people in the room that they've never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ. And their eternity right now is in the balance. Heaven and hell lay before them. I want to pray for anybody in this room it's almost impossible to sit through a service like this and not sense the presence of God in the singing, the presence of God in the preaching. You came here and you're like, I, I've never experienced, I've never felt this way. 
It's not because we're awesome or nifty. It's because the Holy Spirit is in this place. And he got here before you got here. And I want to give you an invitation. Anybody in this room right now, an invitation. Open your heart to Jesus Christ. Listen carefully. I'm not asking you to join our church. I'm not asking you to do anything religious. I'm just saying, have you ever prayed a prayer? Have you ever gone public in your faith with Jesus? I sat in church off and on for 19 years, and I thought I was going to heaven. I thought I had Jesus, but I had religion. Religion is man's attempt to get to a holy God. It always fails. In fact, if Jesus was upset about anything, it was religious leaders. It's not about religion. It's about a personal relationship with the living God. And most of the people in this room have already prayed that prayer, have already embraced Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The question is, have you? Have you? You say, well, I, I don't know. I, I want to do that. Well, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. You'll be born again. And people are praying for you all over the building right now. I'll tell you, this is the most important time of your life is right now. What are you going to do with Jesus? There's only two choices, accept or reject. I'm going to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. It's the greatest invitation ever. Come to me with your baggage. Come to me in your brokenness. Come to me with your mess. Don't have to get your act together. Come to him and he'll get your act together. So all over the building, starting on my right, the far left side, this section right here, if you want to invite Christ into your life, you're coming back to Christ, you're rededicating your life, you don't even understand it all, it's okay. You just know you need Jesus. Would you lift your hand right now? Would you lift up your head and look at me right now in the name? I just agree with you in Jesus' name. You, one, two, three, four of you, five, six, seven, all the way in the back, eight, nine, Anybody else? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 in that section. I agree with you. And if I missed your hand, it's okay. God sees you. Anybody in the middle section, go ahead and lift up your hand right now. I agree with you in Jesus' name. All over the building right now. I agree with you in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and look at me. Nothing to be ashamed of. God loves you. God loves you. God. There's probably 15 or 20 people in the middle section. I agree with you in Jesus' name. You can put your hands down. Off to my left, the far right side. Come on, this is the most important day of your life. Go ahead and lift up your hand. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. And you, and you, and you. Just go ahead and look at me, brother. I agree with you in the name of Jesus. I agree with you, and you, and you. I see your hand, sweetheart. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you all the way in the back over there. I agree with you. Amen. You can put your hands down. Everybody in the room, would you repeat this prayer after me? Father in heaven, today I turn from my sin. I turn from my ways. And I embrace Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth, you are my Lord and Savior. So come into my heart. I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Just two quick things. One more, uh, just real quick. You are here today and you've been waiting, 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 waiting to get married, waiting for a job opportunity, waiting for a platform, waiting for a dream to be fulfilled, waiting for something to come, waiting for uh, injustice to be reconciled, waiting for a relationship to turn around. If that's you, just go and lift up your hand right now. I want to pray for anybody that's in the waiting. Here it is. Take courage, my friend. He's in the waiting. I agree with you in the name of Jesus. Every hand that's lifted right now, we declare, Lord God, as we wait patiently on you, we pray, Lord God, that you would fulfill every desire, you would fulfill every opportunity. God, you are in the waiting. We thank you for that. So for strength and wisdom to be our portion today, we're not gonna lose heart, we're not gonna give up. We trust you in the waiting. And for that, we give you all the thanks and all the praise in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to invite those that are part of our prayer team. If you would come up here right now, make your way to the front.